Welcome to Nagel Rep Success, a podcast series featuring the talent of LGBT real estate agents and allies who inspire the community. I'm your host, David Sirotti. Today we will mix a bit of pharmaceutical sales with our favorite subject, real estate, as we talk with Tori Carrick, who had sales and development as president of the Anderson Real Estate Group with Keller Williams in Long Beach, California. Welcome, Tori. Thanks, David. Before we get into the sales aspect of your life, which is, is quite fascinating, we first have to talk a little bit of water polo because you were a practice squad member of the 1998 USC Trojan National Championship. How tough a sport is water polo? It's a very tough sport. There's a lot more that goes on underneath the water that people don't realize. So um, surprisingly, for being such a small guy, I ended up in the sport of water polo and, 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 and really enjoyed it. I, I got started as, a, as an early teen and, and continued to play through my, my late 20s in master's programs, but re- really, really enjoy the tough sport. It's tough, right? Is it a rough and tumble sport? It is. You know, it's a, there, there's a lot of strategy that goes into it, quickness. The thing that I would share with people often is that the, the way that I was able to compete for, for someone of my size is that I, I often called myself like a water mosquito. If you think of those, those little water mosquitoes that kind of flutter across the top of the, of the pool, that, that, that's the position I would typically play is I could zip all over the pool, which would allow me to compete with the guys who are a lot bigger than me because uh, you, you would think that water or a pool would be the equalizer of size, but what you'd find is that you know, having having real long arms or real long legs or big bodies, even though you're in a pool, that helps a lot. So uh, the only way I could kind of get around those guys is being being fast. You graduated from one of the top business schools in the country and were immediately recruited to work for Eli Lilly Pharmaceuticals. I was hired as a sales rep with the company, and I was based in – in Beverly Hills, my territory was Beverly Hills and West Hollywood, and uh, re- really enjoyed my experience there. It was um, uh, uh, I had always I had always really connected well with people and thought that I would enjoy sales, and this was my first professional sales experience, and I just I, I, I had a great time with the company. You spent three years in Beverly Hills selling. What kind of products were you were you working with? When I was first hired, I, I went into their primary care sales division, and so um, at, at that point we were calling it primary care physicians. Our biggest seller at that time was Prozac, which most people know about, and uh, that, that, that's where I spent the first chunk of my career before I had moved on to the corporate headquarters. And that was, as we said three years later, you were had such such success in your role as a salesperson that the company transferred you and your eventual husband, Jeff, to Indianapolis where you became a trainer, and Jeff actually found his true calling. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think that's the beautiful thing about about life is is things tend to work out the way that they're intended to. But, you know, at the time that that I got the promotion back to Indianapolis, my my boyfriend at that time, now husband Jeff, um, had worked for the city of Long Beach for, for quite some time in their dispatch center at the Long Beach Fire Department, and he was really looking for, for another opportunity in, in, in his career development and uh, thought that it would be a fresh start moving to Indianapolis. And his, his idea at that point was that he was going to go into culinary arts. Well, we ended up partnering up with a, a, a fantastic mom-and-pop boutique agency in downtown Indy called The Flock Real Estate Group, a husband, wife, Kate and Kurt. And they really connected with Jeff so much in the process of us helping, uh, of them helping us find a house that they offered him a job as their unlicensed assistant. So he, uh, he began the process of, you know, installing lock boxes, putting in MLSs, uh, really learned the business from the ground up. And that, that, that began, uh, our, our real estate career path. And we would always joke from that point forward that one day, when I retired from Lilly, that, that I would go to work with Jeff and we'd be the, the Kate and Kurt flock of wherever we were living at that time. What was it about those two that made such an impression on you? You know, it, 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 they're a wonderful couple. I think that they, they really balance each other out very nicely, comp- complementary skill sets. They also dominated the marketplace in which they, they, they worked. And um, 
they were just fun people to be around. And, you know, Jeff and I always had an affection for real estate, but, but this is the first real estate couple that we had seen working together, and we had, you know, been very close to them through the process and thought to ourselves that it was something that we could do as well after we, we watched them. And he had so much joy working with them, Jeff actually got his license. Correct, yeah. So he went from unlicensed assistant, ended up becoming licensed and working with them, and uh, pretty quickly thereafter had transitioned to Century 21. And, and the reason for that is my, my company was the largest mover of people in and out of the state, and uh, I, I, I tended to have a pretty good idea of who was coming and going because of my position. And so uh, uh, Century 21 had the corporate relocation account, and so it was an awesome opportunity for him to to expand his business further because of the the learnings that I had from within my company. So it, it came together really nicely, and his business just took off. And in your job as a trainer, you were working with a lot of, quote, unquote, newbie sales professionals. So you probably saw all types of people. Did that help you in your later career as a sales associate? Yeah, you know, it, it, it really did. Uh, be, being in the sales training department, I, I got to experience uh, what it was like to, to train people on our sales process uh, from all the different sales industries that they came from. So it, it was a real neat learning lab because you had people that had uh, extensive training histories or, or, or were fresh off the college campus uh, but had the personality traits that would align them well in sales. And, and being the one who to walk them through that experience, I was able to pull a lot of the nuggets out of, out of each of their brains of, of kind of what made them all great salespeople. And, and I think that learning lab propelled me to, to do some other things in my career in, in pharma and then and then in my career in real estate. I find it fascinating that there are so few seemingly out there in the real estate industry who came from pharmaceutical sales. Is there a reason for that? You know, I, I think the primary reason is that pharmaceutical sales uh, had been and, and, and continues to be, although maybe to a lesser extent, a, a really lucrative career. You know, it's it's, it's great money. It's 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 uh, it offers stability, flexibility uh, uh, in in your working environment, it's just a really good gig. And, and I think because of that, people don't think that, that real estate is a place that they want to go into. You know, it's, it's a complete about face, you know, independent contractor, uh, no, no benefits, no company car, you know, no, no, no company paid cell phone, uh, no, no quota trips. I mean, it's just a very different dynamic. But that experience working for a very large company in a sales environment uh, taught me so much about what we could bring to the real estate, real estate industry that would help us build a bigger business. And it, it was just taking some of those things that that I loved so much about the pharma industry and translating them to what we did in real estate that I think has really allowed us to propel. Well, we're going to continue the story because it will wind its way back to sunny California. But first, let's pause for a moment and talk about Nagorep. The National Association of Gay and Lesbian Real Estate Professionals was founded in 2007 and is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. Today, the organization continues to grow in size and scope with approximately 1,500 members. NAGOREP benefits include a profile on NAGOREP.com, which receives 75,000 unique visitors a month and is the leading referrer of LGBT clients. 90% of NAGOREP members close one to three deals per year through their membership. 8% close four to six deals per year. And 2% are closing a whopping seven to ten deals per year through their affiliation. NAGOREP is also providing networking with a close-knit group of members and provides outstanding learning opportunities. And, of course, NAGOREP provides its members with the capability to showcase leadership with the ability to address LGBT housing issues at the local, state, and national levels. Listeners can join the association at NAGLREP, N-A-G-L-R-E-P dot com. Hearing you talk about NAGLREP reminded me that just this week our team had uh, opened an escrow with a NAGLREP buyer. So uh, in, in firsthand experience, thank you for the work that you guys do there because it certainly does help us grow our business. How did it work? Uh, well, you, you know, we, we were we were sought out uh, through through the the website. Uh, someone was looking for an LGBT uh, realtor in in our local market, and came to us, and we were able to to help them with the process. It's someone purchasing investment property in in our our local city, and 
their offer was just accepted this week. Why do you think they wanted an LGBT agent? You know, I, I, I think that, that what many of us connect with uh, in the LGBTQ community is that, you know, you, you want to completely be yourself uh, with, with, with who you're going to partner with. And because real estate is such a, a personal experience for so many of us, uh, you know, it, it's one of the most important transactions that, that someone will go through in their life. And you want to be your full authentic self in that experience. And, you know, in the moments that you're freaking out, you want to be able to freak out and, 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 and know that someone's not going to – to judge you, uh, you know, for, for, for who you are in that moment. And I think that if you can really feel personally connected with, with who it is that's helping you through the process, uh, you're much more likely to be successful. I chuckled a little bit when you said freaking out because that's probably what happened to you when you were 26 years old and Eli Lilly transferred you and Jeff back to California to take over a district in Long Beach that was underperforming and put you as such a young kid in charge of a 12-person team. What was that like? You know, it, it, it was it was a little scary. It, it, it was something that, that I had really wanted to do from the moment I was hired. I, I, I felt a greater calling to, to be a leader in the company. But but when the moment came, I, I was I was freaking out um, because nearly all of the team was, was older than me. Uh, many of them had been in the industry longer than me. And you know it, the self-talk uh, didn't align with with uh, what 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 I knew I could do there, right? There was these limiting beliefs that I had held that that, that were holding me back, and it, it was just a really great opportunity to prove to myself, prove to the company, prove to my team that that we could do some great things together. It worked out really well. Did they look differently at you being a young kid? Yeah, I think some of them did, and, and, and you know, I, I, I think to that point, and, and, uh, and even in real estate, when I transitioned to real estate, I think I got some of that as well, but it, it's always given me this, this drive to, to prove even more so that, that, that I'm worthy, and I, I don't know, maybe it's rooted in, in my history of being a gay man, you know, growing up not out and realizing that when people found out I was gay, I wanted them to really believe that, um, well... If, if they didn't necessarily agree with who I was, what I wanted them to do was to dig deeper and say, but I know him so well and he's such a good kid in all these other areas that it doesn't really matter. So I think that that kind of training, that upbringing, that self-talk that we hear so often growing up gay really helps you to succeed in these kind of situations where you might feel like you're the underdog, but you've really got to prove yourself and you've got a life. Uh, behind you that you've lived of doing nothing but proving yourself to achieve success, that you're pretty well suited for these sort of situations. Um, uh, at least in my experience, that's, that's really panned out to be true. The story of you getting into real estate is, is quite remarkable because after the four years of leading the team, you were promoted again. You had the opportunity to go back to Indy, and then you were going to be given international responsibility but then fate intervened. You know, it, it kind of brings back to what we had talked about earlier in this conversation about, about the universe really aligning for you. But, you know, remember, I, I had shared that we had always joked about the idea of us being a real estate couple once I had retired from Lily. And, and we were really going to ride the Lily train because it was, it was such a, a great experience and such a wonderful company. And so we, we, we had said yes, that we would take this other assignment and, and, and kind of follow that path. Uh, in the back of our mind, we were always a little concerned, though, because all roads did lead back to Indianapolis. And, you know, we spent some time there and really enjoyed it. But our family was in Southern California. We talked about building a family of our own and, and, and really didn't want to be trapped to Indy forever. But at that point in, in uh, our careers, we had decided that, that we would go. Well, shortly after uh, uh, I had made this announcement, um, there was a, a voluntary severance plan that was announced because the company was downsizing. And really, the, the intention of this program was to, to entice people to early retirement or, or people who are low performers to maybe put their name in the hat. You know, right before this, I just won the most major award in the company, the Chairman's Ovation Award. You know, I had got this promotion and said I would go. And I looked at the numbers at this, and Jeff and I put our heads together and said, are you kidding me? This, this enhanced severance package, is, this gives us that, that cushion that we've been wanting. And we talked about doing this, you know, when I retired at 60. Why don't we just do it now? And, and uh, you know, if it, if it doesn't work, I can always – I'm young enough, I can fall back into the industry and maybe fall back with a company that's, that's based in California as opposed to based in, in the Midwest. So 
we took that package and and uh, moved forward and haven't looked back. It's been it's been a real wild six plus years since since coming over. But I I, I wouldn't change anything for the world. It, it, it was definitely a a fate experience and it, it definitely uh, adjusted the the course of our life. And so now your your fire department dispatcher turned real estate agent husband Jeff starts your real estate career with a stack of sticky notes and told you to just go crazy. <laughs> yeah, so true. You know, at, at this point, uh, his corporate relocation gig in Indy uh, translated to a corporate relocation gig in Long Beach. He, he was still with C21. And, you know, as, as, as the market shifted in 08, he, he was fortunate enough to get into REO, you know, bank-owned properties. And, and for anybody that knows REO, it is a very labor-intensive, systems-driven business that doesn't really allow you to do much of anything but but keep your head above water. And so, you know, he had all these REOs, but he didn't have capacity to, to follow up on any of the buyer leads that were coming into him. But he, would, he was good enough to at least write their name and number down on a sticky note. Embarrassingly, at that point, we didn't even have a, a, a database, a CRM. So, so literally, you know, one of my first days in the office, he, he, he knew where I came from, my sales experience. He said, you know, here's, here's a stack of sticky notes. See if you can get any appointments. That's how it all began. I, within the first day, I, I booked him an appointment and, and uh, you know, very quickly became the buyer specialist and built up that whole side of the business and brought someone in to help me because we had so many buyers that I couldn't manage them on my own. And now we've got a, a, a team of six buyer specialists in, in our Long Beach operation. And it all started from just that little stack of sticky notes on a dusty desk. <laughs> what role do you play today in that you and Jeff are investors in the Keller Williams Market Center? You run your own 30-person team, but you're not selling. Correct. So, so Jeff and I both came out of production. Jeff's been out of production for um, a, about three years. Uh, after I had uh, built up our buyer's team, I then began to work exclusively as a listing agent, really transitioned our team from a distressed property team to, to, to uh, you know, a, a standard sale team, very much in line with the market today. And, and again, just had more listings than I could manage on my own, so built that out to be a team. So we, you know, my, my role at this point is really to lead our organization, to lead our people to achieve their big goals, their big whys, to deliver on the service and results that we're known for. I, I tell people all the time, because they always ask, so what do you and Jeff do, right? What, what do you guys do? Uh, Jeff, Jeff's a visionary. He's a, uh, a strategic thinker. Uh, he, he's, he's very empirical. He's very database. And so he really uh, is the one with the foresight that will kind of point the ship. You know, he's, he's steering the ship, kind of determining where we should go. Uh, those are not my gifts whatsoever. My gifts are all about powering the engines. So I very much focus on, on, on achieving results through people, uh, working back with our team to get us inspired to make sure that, you know, we're, 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 we're powering the ship as fast and, and as efficiently and as effectively as we can in the direction that Jeff has pointed us. So. That's really what my day is comprised of is, is um, uh, growth and, and uh, problem shooting and uh, just really helping people achieve their big goals. You must be doing something right because your team closed more than 250 transactions, $130 million in sales volume last year. You were ranked number 38 of 8,500 Keller Williams teams, and you're doing this with two boys five and two that were adopted. You and Jeff married in 08. Tell me about the boys. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's great. I, I, I had mentioned to you a, a bit ago that, that as we explored career growth uh, back to, to Indianapolis, one of the things that kept us rooted in Southern California is our, our desire to build a family. So we, we'd always known that we wanted to be parents. And just didn't know exactly how and when we would do it. And, um, you know, coming to real estate, I, Again, I just I, I love the opportunity that you can create in this space. That it really is your own business, and the world is your oyster. And in that, uh, you, you can also make sure to take care of your personal needs as well. And, and building a family was a strong personal need of ours, and we were able to really commit to making that happen. So, um, uh, uh, you know, I could talk about them <laughs> the entire podcast because they're such an important part of what we do. But I, I think, you know, there's a lesson in that also. Uh, you know, we've got Wesley, our, our five-year-old, and Quincy, our two-year-old, uh, both just wonderful little beings, so completely different than uh, of one another. Wesley's a fiery redhead that, that kind of is your classic, you know, uh, uh, redhead if you envision one in your mind. And, 
and Quincy is, is a soft, introspective, quiet one. Um, but but where I'm going with this is, you know, our adoption story was so much like our, our business story, and I think so much like the stories that we all have in our own in our own lives. But you know, we, we had we had really committed to building a family, and uh, we had tried so hard um, uh, in the process, and we were matched with two moms. Uh, both of which had decided to raise the, the children that they were pregnant with on their own during the experience. And yet after striking out twice, we just felt heartbroken. And uh, the, the lesson in that moment is we completely relinquished control, realized that, we, that, that all the inertia was going in the right direction, but we, we didn't have power over the end result, right? This is their mother's bodies. The mothers make the decisions as to what they want to do with their babies because in our case we opted for private adoption. And uh, we just let go. And, um, you know, it was the moment that we let go, literally, within a month of us letting go after trying for two-plus years to build our family. The moment we let go, we got a phone call about Wesley. His mom was, was due in 12 days, and boom, he came into our life. And then on the second experience, learning from the first one, we realized we want to put the wheels in motion, but we have to relinquish control. We assembled our, 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 our team of um, of adoption professionals to help us get the ball rolling and, and put, put the energy out there that we wanted to build a family. And Without without doing some of the required steps in order to go there, uh, we got a call about Quincy and, and, and his mom. So it just was a real powerful lesson, again, about, in my mind, in our mind, um, the, the strong power of intention. That if you, if you really put your mind, heart, and soul aligned with the goal that you have in mind and the inertia is behind you, you can't always control the end result, but you can control the energy that you put out there. And it's, it's worked out really well for us. Were there challenges in the adoption process because you were a gay couple? No, not, not necessarily. Uh, uh, you know, for us, um, in private adoption, the mothers have a choice on, on uh, who they would like to raise their children. And so they clearly knew our family story. They knew we were a gay couple, and, and they were completely comfortable with that. Are you going to leave the boys home when you attend the NAGAREP conference? You know, we, we, we likely are. Uh, we're, we're big believers in, in putting on your oxygen mask first, right? You, you, know, you know, when you fly, what, what's the thing they always tell you, David, during your, your, your warnings when you're sitting down in your seat? Put what do your, they share? Put your oxygen mask on first before you help the people with you. Yep, exactly, right? So we, we feel like we have to consistently fill our, our education buckets, our, our relationship buckets, um, you know, a, a, as a couple – uh, to really pour into our children. So, so when it comes to things like the Niagara Conference in Palm Springs, we will certainly uh, um, spend some time out there uh, as a couple learning and growing and then come back as, as better parents and better business leaders to the kids and to the team. Well, I know you're looking forward to that fourth annual Niagara National LGBT Real Estate Conference. It's only 115 miles from you in Long Beach. Straight shot on the 10. Yep, yeah. very close. It's onwards to Palm Springs, October 17th to the 19th. More than 700 are expected to attend in what will be the largest LGBT and allied real estate event ever. Registration is open at nagorep.com. Tori, let's go into you on the pharmaceutical side as an agent and as a manager. Are there some things first on the agent side that you learned that translated to real estate and that we can learn from? It, it, it's a great question. I, I think there's a lot to learn, and, and it, it caused me to really be introspective to think, what was it that, that I learned in pharma that, that translated so well to achieving success in real estate? And, and while I boil it down, I, I really think it comes down to three different pieces. The first is knowing your product. So, so you know, in, in pharma, you need to know the, the products that you're representing. I mean, there's deep scientific knowledge that goes into that, because if you're going to have conversation with physicians, you have to know your product. And the same thing is to be said about real estate. You know, to, to me, it's been, it's been very important, and I've been very intentional on making sure that we know our inventory. What, what, what are the listings that exist in the market? Uh, who are the competition that, that we're competing against in our marketplace? And, and, and who are our clients? You know, who, who are the people that we serve? What, what are they expecting when they come to us? But, but really knowing that product at a very deep level is essential. Um, second piece I think is critical that I learned in pharma was knowing your script. So when our sales reps came through sales training, they were taught a messaged verbatim script. The intention was never that they would recite that verbatim script to a physician uh, in a hallway of an office, but it would be that they would know that script so well that they could personalize it for that client, 
Uh, they can adapt it for the moment. And I think the same thing needs to be said in real estate. We all need to know what our value proposition is and the, the associated script, and then find ways that we can communicate that to our clients in, in any scenario. Uh, last piece that I think has, has really helped me achieve success and helped our team achieve some great success is the aspect of proactively communicating. You know, it's one of the things that I was taught at, at Lilly, but, but I think so often in our business, because we're, we're reliant on others in the real estate industry to provide information, we tend to not always have the answers. And our clients are left uh, um, empty-handed without, without answers to their questions and are on the edge of their seats. And so one of the things that I've always tried to do is just not waiting to get information, you know, going out to get it. And even if I don't have information, proactively communicating to the clients, and it might sound something like this. You know, John, I, I know that we're waiting for an answer uh, from the other side. I want you to know that I've, I've been all over it. As a matter of fact, I've, I've left three messages today. Uh, I don't have an answer yet, but as soon as I get one, I'll call you. And I just wanted you to know that, that this is top of mind for me and very important. So, so uh, rest assured that I'm all over it, and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. That kind of communication that I think doesn't exist enough in our industry, uh, and if it did, I think that the client experience would be a lot better. On the team side, talk about servant leadership. Yeah, no, th thanks for bringing that up, David, because I, 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 people often ask us the, the, the secret sauce of building our team, and one of the questions that, that I've asked myself is if we have access to the same information, the same training, the same systems, how is it that, that, that teams uh, can have such wild differences in their results, or real estate agents can have such wild differences in their results. And, and I think it boils down to a few things, specifically on the team side. I, I believe that first and foremost it starts with servant leadership. Uh, my, my personal leadership philosophy is that the people that, that, that um, I support come first. So if you were to look at an org chart, you might look at me and think that everybody beneath me uh, 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 would be treated as such, you know, kind of the old school model that our parents probably subscribed to in the the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, but, but you know, that world has changed so much. And, and, and from my personal experience, the leaders that I've, I've really thrived the most under have been people that really took a vested and deep interest in who I was an individual, um, how they could best serve me, how they could help me, uh, uh, who I really was, uh, um, what my needs and wants were. And, and when I felt the leader connecting to me on that level, I would do anything in the world to help them win. And so I, I'm really intentional on, on doing that with our team, uh, really bringing the aspects of servant leadership alive, not just within uh, uh, the leadership levels of our organization, but all levels, just getting us in the mindset of, of serving one another. But, you know, invariably, real estate is, uh, I mentioned a bit ago, you know, people freaking out in transactions. And, you know, that could be us as agents, us as leaders, us as clients, but there's a lot of drama, right? And, and, and I just feel that whether... Uh, you're leading a real estate team, uh, a sports team, uh, a group of clients as a real estate agent. Communication eliminates drama. The more that we can communicate to people, uh, the, the more that we can really fill their head uh, with messages of comfort and just connect the dots for them so they're not left without information. You're also a big believer in a three-letter word, why. If, if I don't understand people's whys, the people that I align in my life, and that can be a client that I'm serving, an agent that I'm supporting. I think that if you can really understand people's whys and find ways to help them get what they want, they are so much more apt to do whatever they can to help you. Well, you've really helped all of us today understand how the training in pharmaceutical definitely translates. Your tips are incredible, and I think it's fair to say that Eli Lilly's loss is definitely real estate's game. We can't thank you enough for taking time to join us. We congratulate you and Jeff on growing your business to become one of the leading teams in all of real estate. Thank you so much, Tori, for joining us. Thank you, David. I've appreciated the time. I look forward to seeing many of you at Naga Rep Conference in Palm Springs. This has been Naga Rep Success. Until next time, I'm David Sorodi.